All right. Um, welcome, everybody. We are again in another edition for the Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Month. And we welcome all of you to this last week uh, of talks. We are very excited about our uh, speaker today. But before we do that, I'm going to um, launch a poll. We are recording this presentation. This presentation is going to be posted later um, in the Hawaii Invasive Species YouTube channel. And you can um, rewatch or share this presentation with other people as well. So I'm going to launch a poll right now. It's going to stay on for a few um, minutes. My name is Leila Kaufman. I am a, a program coordinator with the Hawaii Invasive Species Council. I have here Stephanie Isley. She is um, a legal fellow from the coordinating group of um, alien pest species. And she will be helping me with the moderation of, the, of this talk and will be introducing the speakers in a little bit. So I will keep this poll for a little bit longer as we welcome more people to this presentation. And just as housekeeping, um, you can um, actually type your questions in the chat box or the Q&A box um, throughout the presentation. So you don't need to wait until the last minute. So if you have a question you might wanna ask um, while the presenter is uh, speaking, just please type it there and we will go through that. So I will end the poll right now. Um, yes, and then I will let uh, Stephanie introduce our speakers. Share this for you. Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Stephanie Easley with the Coordinating Group on Alien Pest Species. And this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing our panelist, Lee Greenwood. Um, Lee is the Forest Health Program Director for the Nature Conservancy and the coordinator of the Don't Move Firewood campaign. That campaign began in 2008, and it is an outreach partnership managed by the Nature Conservancy. The goal of the Don't Move Firewood campaign is to protect trees and forests from invasive pests, um, insects and diseases that travel in or on contaminated firewood. The central tenet of the Don't Move Firewood campaign is that everyone has a role to play in slowing the spread of invasive insects that are killing trees through making better informed firewood choices. Lee is based in Missoula, Montana, she visit, where she is now, where it is the coldest day in over a year, she said this morning. Uh, she visited the Big Island with the National Association of State Foresters in 2019 to see the effects of rapid ohia death, as well as informally check out the commercial firewood situation on the island. After Lee's presentation, um, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. We have with us Dr. Helmut Rogue from the Hawaii Department of Agriculture to help answer questions related to the firewood situation in Hawaii. Dr. Rogue is an entomologist with a doctorate in agricultural sciences. He has worked since 1987 in a variety of integrated pest management and biocontrol programs across the world, including in Nigeria, Bolivia, Ecuador, and the United States. From 2004 through 2021, Helmut worked for the Oregon Department of Agriculture as the program manager of the Insect Pest Prevention and Management Program and the director of the Plant Protection and Conservation Programs Area in Salem, Oregon. In 2021, Helmut joined the Hawaii Department of Agriculture as the administrator of the Plant Industries Division. And in that role, he is leading the effort to adopt measures to protect Hawaii from pests carried by firewood. So with that, um, we're very grateful that Lee could join us today and I'll turn it over to her. Thanks very much for the great introduction, Stephanie. Uh, so first, let me try to get my presentation queued up. Should work just fine. That should be presentation mode, hopefully. Um, and thanks for having me. Uh, so today what I'm going to be doing is a hopefully not too long presentation on the invasive tree pests and firewood pathway um, and how Hawaii's risks and opportunities are pretty unique um, in the realm of forest pests. And um, this is a webinar that uh, I prepared as part of my work with the Firewood Outreach Coordinating Initiative, which is an uh, um, initiative that I manage, um, and specifically for the Hawaii Invasive Species Awareness Week event uh, going on right now uh, throughout the month. 
So it's actually Awareness Month, sorry. Um, so I started off this presentation thinking about, you know, why is Hawaii particularly special? And when I was pulling out photos to add to my um, presentation to keep it from being incredibly boring with just uh, text, I thought about this one, which is the picture from the hotel I stayed at when I was able to visit for work a few years back. Um, and it's, it's palm trees. And so um, thinking about palm trees, I really would like to hear from everybody. Um, and just say first, hold up, hold up. Before I even get started, I've got a question for everybody on this webinar, and I'd like you to um, ideally put your answer into the chat so that everybody can see it. The chat is a little different from Q&A, so make sure you click the chat. If you can't see it, there's probably three little dots that say more, and you might be able to open chat there. And the question for the chat is, in your experience, on the Hawaiian Islands, where you live, where you visit anything, and if, if you don't live or visit Hawaii, please don't answer because it'll get really confusing. What do you use for firewood when you use firewood? Are you using um, a particular tree? Are you using something that isn't a particular tree? And I'd like everybody to just take a moment and say, you know, last, last Christmas we had a bonfire on the beach and I used driftwood. Um, or, you know, there was unfortunately a dead ohia tree in my backyard, and that's what we used. Um, and so if everybody could start by just putting that answer in the chat, and um, that would actually be incredibly helpful, um, because I really honestly don't know. And when I went to Hawaii for work, um, and I did a little road trip, and I went to a bunch of different like picnic areas and um, stores, I... I didn't really get a good answer. So this is really useful. Um, so uh, driftwood is coming up, a uh, wood that I'm not entirely certain how to pronounce. Call, uh, why? I don't know, help me. Um, invasive black wattle, lychee. Oh, I know that fruit. I didn't actually realize it was a tree. Uh, uh, mesquite family. Okay, thank you, Amber, for that help. Um, Awesome, so keep putting that in. Um, I do remember when I was driving around Hawaii, I saw a bunch of um, invasive eucalyptus trees. So I was wondering maybe if people cut that down, I don't know. Um, but keep putting in, oh, thank you for the pronunciation. Uh, keep putting in what you use for firewood or even like what your neighbor uses for firewood if you never use it, but you know what they do. That would be extremely helpful to me. So thank you all for that. Okay, now what I'm gonna do is the main body of my presentation. Um, but I didn't wanna forget, so I really appreciate that. Let's review a little bit of vocabulary because in order to actually understand this presentation, we have to have a shared basis of vocabulary and it's not always entirely clear. So a quarantine when used in a forest pest context, which is what I'm going to use it for, is a regulatory effort by some governmental entity to control the movement of some sort of pest. And the, the intent of a quarantine is typically to reduce its economic or environmental impacts, or sometimes also just to enable an eradication program by limiting the problem. There's two different types of quarantines. There's external or exterior quarantines, and those keep things out of an uninfested area. So in that context, an external quarantine for Hawaii would keep things off the islands. An internal quarantine keeps problematic materials in. So for instance, if only one island had a particular pest, that island might say nothing that could potentially spread that pest can leave our island that would be an internal quarantine. So it maintains a pest in a discrete area. Um, let me close up the chat, but please, if anybody else has an idea for firewood, please put it in the chat. Um, regulated items are, as you would think, anything under the regulation that could be part of, in this case, a quarantine. So for instance, um, fruit, could be a regulated item for some pests, um, especially agricultural pests, but lots of other things can be regulated items. A classic example of a regulated item is pallets. Um, pallets are made from you know, dimensional wood, but those things can in fact carry pests. Um, in this presentation, the regulated item I'm going to talk about a lot is firewood, but almost none of the regulated um, pests or pests of concerns in this presentation only would spread on firewood. In fact, I don't think any of them solely spread on firewood. So I will kind of casually call regulated items and firewoods a little bit similar, but just know that those are not synonymous terms. 
Uh, additionally, one of the pests that we're going to be talking about today, uh, spongy moth, uh, is named Lymantria dispart in Latin, and the old name was gypsy moth. So you may be familiar with the older name. The new name is um, going to be officially recognized by the Entomological Society next week, most likely, if everything goes according to plan. So what I'm going to do is look forward, um, because the old name was offensive, and I will do my very best to remember to call this particular pest spongy moth from here on in the presentation. But just so you know, um, if you're not familiar with the new name, uh, it is the Lymantria dispar species. Okay, we're going to keep up on vocabulary, but I promise this is almost done here. There are many different treatments for wood, but when we talk about firewood, we usually talk about heat treatment. And when we talk about heat treatment, there are three typical treatment levels. Um, Counterintuitively, they are A, B, and C, but A, B, and C are not like high, medium, low. Um, it actually goes B, A, C, which is a little confusing. And um, each of them applies to a different grouping of things. None of this is really incredibly crucial for your understanding, except for the fact that sometimes a particular external quarantine or internal quarantine will require one of these treatment codes, and sometimes a receiving entity requires a different treatment, so a different level of heat treatment. So it's important to know that there are three commonly used heat treatments. Sometimes that means that heat treatments don't perfectly match up. Okay, so when it comes to firewood, you can use regulations that apply to firewood um, in order to prevent the movement of forest pests. And to understand the world of regulations, you can kind of wrangle those different regulations that apply to firewood into several different broad categories to sort of conceptually divide them up. Some regulations are driven by the pests themselves. So those might be federally regulated pests where the regulation is held by USDA APHIS, or it might be a pest of concern that is not federally regulated. So it might have a state um, regulation or um, it may not be regulated at all as well if it's some types of pests, but we're gonna talk about regulations for now. Then there's also um, spatially drawn regulations. So they're not being driven by the pests particular geography. They're being driven by geopolitical boundaries or ecological boundaries that are relevant to the movement of firewood. So these would include international boundaries, an individual state border boundary. Um, in the case of Hawaii, this would include the physical boundaries of the different islands um, and land-based boundaries uh, that are smaller than that. So for instance, like um, inside versus outside of a park would be a spatially drawn regulation that is land-based. There are also regulations that are based on the distance from the origin of the materials. These are less common, but they do exist. Um, and several different states use distance from origin regulations because the issue of moving firewood and having it transport forest pests is that the farther you move it ecologically, the longer it would have taken for the pest to get there itself. So very short movement of firewood is likely relatively harmless, but a long movement of firewood could potentially spread a forest pest vastly farther than it would ever naturally move. And in the case of Hawaii, it would never cross the Pacific Ocean, realistically speaking, in order to reach the islands. Um, and so when we think about distance from origin regulations, you see that they actually have a really strong scientific basis, much more so than some of the pest-driven regulations or the spatially drawn regulations do. But at the same time, they're very difficult for the public to implement and for people to kind of wrap their head around. So when we look at pest-driven regulations, there's a whole bunch of federally regulated pests. And when I was reviewing these pests, I noticed that every single one of them is relevant to the islands of Hawaii. So that's really helpful to know. So there are federally re federal regulations that prevent the movement of regulated items, such as Asian longhorn beetle, spongy moth, giant African snail, we'll get to that one because it's special, um, red imported fire ant, and sudden oak death, which is also Pytothera remorum. So these particular regulations, in theory, should protect Hawaii from the entrance of materials that might be contaminated with them, with the potential exception of giant African snail because it's present um, in Hawaii. And what's interesting is when you look at some of the geographic um, distributions of these invasive pests that can be transported on firewood, you can very quickly see that there's a lot of relevance to potential um, 
mainland to island movement of materials. So for instance, uh, imported fire ant is all over the southern um, tier of the United States on the eastern half, uh, very limited but potentially very important um, uh, location in California because that is where there's a major port. Likewise, sudden oak death uh, has widespread um, regulated areas and quarantined counties that uh, are in Northern California and the Southern um, tip of Oregon. And so materials that are coming from there, if they were in violation of the quarantines that should be controlling them would potentially pose an issue for the Hawaiian islands. So you also have all of these pest driven regulations that are not federally regulated. Um, here's some examples of a various application to Hawaii. Um, Mountain pine beetle, for instance, um, Minnesota maintains an exterior quarantine to prevent the entrance of mountain pine beetle into Minnesota because that's not where it's native. Um, you all are much more familiar than I am with the need to limit the movement of potentially infected um, materials with rapid ohia death pathogen on it. Um, and at the bottom of this is a little clip from a um, handout I saw a while back that specifically called out firewood on the ohia wood issue. Um, spotted lanternfly uh, has lots of different state regulations, but not one overarching federal regulation that applies to it. So in theory, those state regulations, if properly applied, would reduce the chance of firewood entering Hawaii front with spotted lanternfly egg masses on them. And then we have um, two different very small beetle families that could potentially cause problems in an area like Hawaii. Um, laurel wilt, which is a fungus associated with beetle, um, which is found in the eastern United States in a really similar geographic scope as the um, red imported fire ant map you saw before, um, as well as the shot hole borer complex, which is, I think, three species, although the science on that is kind of constantly evolving, of different shot hole borers found in California. Probably the most problematic one is called the um, polyphagus or polyphagus, depending on who pronounces it, shot hole borer. And that one, um, as given the name, has a very wide range of trees that it drills holes into and kills. Now, beyond all of those, we have these spatially drawn regulations. And one of these in particular is very relevant to the state of Hawaii. And what that is, is the international non-contiguous regulation, which is to say, Hawaii is surrounded by other countries besides the United States. And so materials that come in from any other country besides the United States are going to be regulated through that set of spatially drawn regulations that are held by USDA APHIS and um, on the ground maintained by the presence of Customs and Border Protection. Now there's also less relevant um, regulations such as those in and out of the contiguous United States and Canada, as well as Hawaii and Canada, um, and then Mexico across the land border. Um, but those are less relevant for your situation in the islands. Then we have a wide variety of land base. And you know, I had to, I must admit, I had to look up whether or not Hawaii allowed camping on its national parks. And the answer I found is yes. And so you should know that the national parks system has a wide variety of different um, implemented rules on firewood. I didn't actually see any rules specific to firewood when I took a quick look the other day, um, but that is a great example of a land-based federal lands regulation on the movement of firewood that could exist throughout the Hawaiian islands, depending on which entity decided to implement it. Then we have intrastate boundaries. That's the last item on this. Um, and that's incredibly relevant to your islands because you have natural boundaries between them. And so if you have an infestation on one island and you successfully regulate and stop the movement of materials off that island, you can limit the damage of that particular infestation. So all of this is to say that together there's a lot of options for how you regulate firewood. And Hawaii is really on the cusp, which is why we have our other speaker, Helmut, here to discuss why they're on the cusp and what they're planning to do of changing the color of how they are represented on this map because many states take the option of regulating firewood only from the pest driven perspective. So that's kind of the um, pale butter yellow color. Um, and those states are where Hawaii has been in the past. So Hawaii's regulations specifically called out a pest of concern. It was the pine shoot moth um, is the one that we were able to find. And that limited the movement of pine-based materials onto the islands. However, 
Other forest pests were not limited by that regulation. For instance, a forest pest that um, traveled on hardwood firewood would not have been legally limited by that specific regulation. And so that's not a complete barrier to the entry of materials. The states that do have a legal complete barrier to the entry of materials are the ones that are this sort of brick red, all out of state firewood states. So you can see those are seven states um, and Hawaii is looking to join that club, which we'll discuss later, along with Nevada, Illinois, and Michigan. Um, three states have somewhat um, different regulations that sort of frame up how the regulation is built really differently from the brick colored states. So Oregon, Utah, and Connecticut have really different systems than the other ones, but they're fairly complete systems. Uh, 26 states have, as I said, that sort of pest-based system. So there's a, a threat and you regulate specifically to that threat. And then 14 states have no exterior regulation that um, is held by the state that protects the movement of potentially contaminated material or prohibits the movement of potentially contaminated materials into the state. I should check actually the chat to make sure nobody's calling me out with questions. Nope, okay, good. Now, um, Hawaii, like I said, is actually in pretty good company. Uh, as the, uh, my uh, employee, Laurel Downs, has been building this tremendous research report on the presence and absence of firewood regulations and outreach and certifications throughout the entire United States. And I pulled out the section specific to Western states so that we could see the variation. Um, between them. And firewood specific or relevant state or federal intrastate rules and regulations. So that would, in your case, generally speaking, mean inter-island, although it's totally conceivable it could be from one side of an island to another. They do exist um, on Hawaii. Uh, and they also exist in other Western states, but they don't cover everything. So like what I mentioned, when it comes to California, for instance, California has a number of invasive shot hole borers, but there is no regulation on the movement of materials in or out of the shot hole borer infested areas at this time. This actually brings up another small mystery that I need help from all the participants on this webinar, although maybe more than one of you knows the answer to it. Does every Hawaiian island have giant African snail known to be present? If anybody knows the answer decisively, please put it in the chat because as funny as it is, we've had a really hard time figuring out the answer to that question. And the reason I'm asking that question is because giant African snail is one of the most um, troublesome invasive species of tropical islands. And if you do not have it on every island, that's good to know because that suggests that intrastate rules or regulations could potentially still protect some of the biological resources of the uninfested islands. But if you've got it on all the islands, um, that would not be a productive choice. So if you want to put that in the chat, I would welcome that information. Last but not, oh, somebody put it in the chat. Let's see what we got here. It's definitely on Maui. All right, well, we got one island down and I do not know how many islands you technically have, but there's more for sure. So um, if everybody wants to put on which islands they know it's on, that would be good too. State-based firewood heat treatment certification. So what this specifically is, is whether or not a state agency has the legal ability and program to certify firewood to any of those three standards I talked about during the vocabulary introduction of this presentation. So can you say with certainty, because you have the probes and the staff to deploy the probes and the kilns to create heat charts of, um, can you say that firewood has been functionally brought to the correct um, temperature for the correct duration of time to render it legally certified as heat treated according to one of those standards? The dark green states are the states that currently either have a program that's active with firewood vendors that use it in order to create uh, legally heat treated firewood, or they fully have the capacity and the materials and the intent, but they simply don't have a firewood vendor that is currently taking them up on that ability. Um, we colored those the same because it doesn't matter. You know, if, if you could, but there's no demand, that's just as acceptable as if you are actively doing so because there is demand. There's three states currently trying to build that capacity in their state quite actively. Those are the ones with the boxes on them. So Louisiana, Illinois, and Michigan but they don't currently have it. So they definitely um, have that, will you know, turn the other color on this map sometime soon. 
Um, and then there's a bunch of states that have declined to engage in this um, particular type of program. And that sometimes is because they do not have the legal authority to do so according to their state rules. Um, sometimes it is because they do not have the funding and so they have no intent to build it. And sometimes it's because they see absolutely no need to do so. So there's lots of different reasonings for why a state may not um, engage in a heat treatment certification program, typically through the Department of Agriculture. Um, and then we also um, have not yet determined whether or not there's any such program uh, in the five different island territories, just for reference. That's why those are great. Now, right now, this gets a little bit interesting because if you look, you can see that Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and California all do not have a state-based um, firewood heat treatment certification capability. So they don't certify firewood as heat treated. But if Hawaii is going to put in place an external quarantine that says that all firewood entering Hawaii has to be compliant in some way, that means that, that the nature of that compliance will have to, if the firewood is going to be coming from California, Oregon, Washington, or Alaska, will have to be non-based in heat treatment. Because otherwise there won't be a way for firewood producers in those states to bring firewood into Hawaii. And this is why I want helmets to talk later because I'm really interested in how that mismatch like we were talking about earlier is going to play out in terms of the external um, quarantine that Hawaii is planning. Uh, all right, so we've got two islands covered, Oahu and Maui, both have giant African land snail. Thank you for your um, input, everybody. One of the funniest things about what happened when I went to Hawaii was that I found the only firewood for sale in several different stops um, that was outside, like on a patio and bundles, was from Europe. It was from Latvia, I think it was. Um, Latvia is a Baltic state. Um, they've got a lot of birch there. And a lot of people have said like, that's insane. Like, why are you, you know, why would Hawaii be bringing Latvian firewood in? And the answer is that basically global supply chains are very complicated. And European split white birch has to be certified heat treated. It says it right on that label that I've got a picture of. This picture was taken in Waimea, by the way, on the big island. Um, it was heat treated at a very high temperature for um, a significant amount of time in accordance to the federal regulations of international movement of timber and timber products. And so, I mean, this is as close to biologically inert as a wood product can be. Um, and so when you look at supply chains and how businesses in Hawaii are going to be ordering their inventory on a grand scale, it actually does make a fair amount of sense that they would just check a box and say, we want heat treated firewood. And it just so happens that the distribution center that is working with them sends them Latvian firewood. But it doesn't have to be that way. You could make other choices in different um, parts of Hawaii to um, encourage local uh, sourcing of firewood or not. Um, and that is an interesting question that definitely has a lot of nuance given wood availability, labor costs, um, the different limitations that various different types of pests may create and so forth. So um, that's my last slide. Um, and I'm very excited that I hit what I was hoping for, which is approximately 30 minutes of talking. Um, and now we have lots of time for questions. Thank you so much, Ali, like for the great presentation. And yeah, we now welcome um, any questions that you guys might have. Um, you can use the Q and A or the chat box to um, to ask any questions for um, Lee or for our panelists as well. I have um, uh, two questions for Lee. Um, the first one is with respect to that Latvian firewood that you just showed in the slide. Um, do, do any states deal with re-export domestically or once it's heat treated to come into the United States, it's characterized as heat treated even if it sits in a, a warehouse in Texas or whatever before being sent to New York or Hawaii? Yes, he, yes unless there was some extraordinarily unusual circumstance. Once it has been um, 
heat treated, it, it remains a heat treated product. So for instance, if it sat in a warehouse in Hawaii, in Texas, and that warehouse happened to be within the red imported fire ant quarantine, um, the assumption is that the warehouse is keeping it safe, essentially. There are, like I said, there's very rare exceptions to that sort of rule, but that is the, the general gist of it. And Helmut, I see that you're gonna weigh in, which is great. Yeah, I just wanted to add, and you mentioned it already. So everything that comes in foreign is under APHIS, our federal counterparts regulations. So um, in general, they have an import permit, otherwise they wouldn't be able to bring it into the country in the first place. I ran into these guys. I had even no idea because I left Germany before the wall came down. So that Latvia is even a country. So I talked to these guys because it showed up in, in Oregon as well, this firewood. I said, why in the world are we importing that stuff from Latvia? Um, so I called the guy, we had a good talk and they were confirming they have a, a, a permit. I made sure we put the, the firewood in um, 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 hatching out tube, nothing was in there. And this is, as, as Lee said, this is all about somebody can make a buck and that's what they're doing. Uh, there's a demand there and hey, there's a product and that's what they're shipping around. I haven't seen it here yet, but um, Mike um, here bought several firewoods, um, you know, firewood um, um, options. One was from Utah, one was from California. And so we can get to this um, later on. But I just wanted to add that stuff. They do have a, an import permit and there are um, regulations from the federal government on import of firewood. Yeah, and we see this firewood show up, not this exact firewood, but we see Estonian and Latvian Europe, European firewood show up all over the United States. Um, I have uh, various colleagues around the country that send me photos because mm -hmm. people find it kind of funny. And so they end up sending photos of it. And I've seen it coming in from DC. Um, they sell it at Whole Foods. It's one of the standard sort of inventory items at Whole Foods. Uh, and um, it's they have seen it in Montana, which is really absurd. Um, and then Hawaii. So it shows up quite a bit. And again, it's all heat treated. So setting aside the sort of intrinsic craziness of the fact that we're importing bundles of firewood from Latvia and Estonia, um, it is a safe product. Thank you. I have one other question. Um, Please. And <clears throat> this one's more complicated and it relates to local firewood. You know, when you were asking your poll in the beginning, like what do people use for firewood here? And when we're trying to balance out like promoting local firewood um, versus protecting against pests coming on imported firewood, we do have rapid ohia death, which you're familiar with. And we, you know, really restrict the movement of ohia around the islands to, to try to prevent that from moving. And so we're, you know, just thinking about having that issue, which is very, very serious. We're struggling with how to promote or package or communicate you know, safe local firewood. What is that and how can we identify it and communicate that to the public? This is so hard because you do have, you know, you have a major critical ecological tree being destroyed by a forest pest that can be transmitted on firewood. Um, you've got lots of other trees that would not be a problem if you cut them up and use them for firewood, but that is perhaps beyond the public's ability to really internalize and properly act upon. Um, it's there's really no great answer to this, but the good news is you're not, I mean, good news slash bad news is you're not alone. This is a problem with many forest pests across the continental United States as well. You know, we see this with emerald ash borer, as you say, like use, use local firewood, but you know, your local firewood might be contaminated with emerald ash borer. Um, and so, um, you know, you do have a unique opportunity in that you have islands and you can, you know, do specific messaging for the um, invasion stage of a given island or, or a side of an island in the, depending on your exact circumstances. Um, uh, but there's, this is not a question that has an easy answer, which is why I'm glad you brought it up. I mean, it's really 
I hate to say, I really don't know exactly how best to address this aside from the fact that you do have safe local firewood and perhaps in cases where it is clear which type of firewood we, would be used or which type of firewood you can recommend, that might be an avenue. So for instance, the eucalyptus and pine, you cannot get rapid ohia death. And I don't feel like anyone would mistake them for ohia trees, having seen those. Um, you know, maybe that's an option. And I don't know what the mesquite that you have, which I need to learn how to pronounce, looks like, but perhaps it's separate enough that that would be also, you know, a way to differentiate and allow the public to use local firewood in a safe way. I'm going to practice it though. Let's try it. Kiave, how'd that go? That's it. That's very good. <laughs> All right, we're gonna learn something new every day. Helmut, I have a question. I know the state is working on uh, firewood rules. What is the status of that? And what will that um, look like? Well, thank you, Leila. And, and, and first I wanna acknowledge you, Leila and uh, Lee Greenwood and her, Leila Lee, we're getting here confused. Um, and, and Nature Conservancy, there are really, um, the experts here for, for a long, long time. And um, I've known um, Lee for quite some time now and got inspired about doing now Hawaii for the firewood um, quarantine rule. We have a good draft ready and I got some help from Stephanie as well and um, some of my colleagues here in house. We have a draft and um, I send it get out again yesterday, I think, so we can try to, once the, the, the legislative session is kind of um, waning, we can probably refocus on the quarantine and make it a good draft. A, an important part is now to um, identify local firewood producers, get them involved in the process of drafting the firewood rule. So we don't wanna blindside people here and put something in place that you know, is counterproductive. Um, we want the rule that actually works. Um, and we've seen that it is necessary, as I mentioned before, Mike bought firewood at a couple of grocery stores here in Oahu had some stuff out. They were riddled with um, termites and some other bugs. Um, it is a big concern. Um, we are trying to work something out here also, just to get you, give you an idea. The, the latest one came from Utah. I contacted my counterpart in Utah about this. Even though Utah has a really good quarantine for firewood coming into Utah, but firewood produced in Utah, hey, send it out, send it to Hawaii. Um, and we have some issue there, and, and that's that's a big concern there. So the same with California, that California producer was very proud on the label saying no tree was felled by um, in production of this firewood. So they're using scrap firewood, which is even more risky because you have firewood lying around a, a wood a lying around for a long time that attracts secondary um, pests. So it is needed for Hawaii, I'm, 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 I've got convinced. Um, and so hopefully, as you know, between draft and getting it through the bureaucratic process, it will take probably seven months or longer. We have to get it through several subcommittees, get it through the Plant and Animal Advisory Committee. We have to make a recommendation to the State Ag Board, and they are the ultimate authority to approve a quarantine that then gets signed by my chairperson, my boss here with the Department of Agriculture. That process can take, as I said, seven to 12 months, I was told. Yeah, and Helmut, you bring up a really good point in all of this, which is that in the absence of an all-encompassing regulation, things like reclaimed firewood can bring in 
everything under your wildest imagination. Um, you know, lizards, um, coquille frogs, which I know you all really do not appreciate. Mm -hmm. Snails, slugs, um, terrestrial snails are particularly well suited to traveling on firewood because of their egg laying and sort of um, use of small, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Use of small spaces to shelter. So um, firewood is a huge problem for snails. Um, anything with a stationary egg case. So for instance, spongy moth, like I talked about and spotted lanternfly, that entire ecological group, which is not specific to a certain set of um, insects or anything, but just sort of like stationary cryptic egg cases, all of that is a nightmare when it comes to reclaimed wood or wood that is um, not otherwise designated by a federal regulation to be restricted or regulated. Um, and so for, uh, you know, for the Hawaiian Islands in particular, I think some of the struggles that you have being disconnected from the mainland are actually beyond just the scope of forest pests and just the thing, and just within the realm of any old thing that can be adhering into or on firewood. Um, and, and you know, we we see those things elsewhere, but I feel like for your climate and your isolation, it's particularly problematic. And 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 um, I I can remember I had to um, um, get out for something quickly, so I'm not sure if you mentioned one of the reasons. Also, we kind of refocused on firewood was the deregulation of emerald ash for. Uh, um, was it last year or so by the federal government? So that means now we got firewood out the wazoo in eastern states, and they're looking for markets. Since there's no more, as Lee mentioned, um, or a lot of states lost their ability to um, certify kiln tried um, firewood. So that now falls on the importing state. So, and, and you mentioned that, Lee, and I, I heard that. Um, so we're gonna put in our firewood regulation, the highest, the 71, 71, if you go with you know, Celsius and, and, and the metric system there. Um, so we're putting that on the exporting state, that requirement that they have to be kiln dried or heat treated. Um, that's up to them, but uh, we have to figure out how we can enforce that and make sure, hey, there's a there's a, 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 a certification coming with that firewood from California, which does not have currently um, certification program or Oregon or Washington or any other state with that. So that's going to be interesting how that will work out in practice once we have the quarantine in place and then notify all the states and importers um, about the regulation. And just to mention that um, the shot hole border that Lee mentioned, um, it is widespread in Southern California. And again, you know, you have downed wood. What do people do? Hey, I can make a buck. I make some firewood and sell it. And that's the problem. And, and, and they're not doing it intentionally. They're just trying to get rid of some firewood. Um, but it's a big risk for the, the state that does not have the ability to check on firewood or has a, not a firewood uh, quarantine. Yes, and I would say, um, and Laurel can help me out with this if I stumble on it too badly, but we are struggling a little bit with the certification situation with the state of California specifically. Um, we have not conclusively figured out that they have no ability to certify firewood as heat treated. It certainly isn't obvious if they do, but we are still working on that fi the finer details of the California heat treatment certification program right now. Okay. Some so, of these things are very much in development. So I'm just trying to be very clear, you know, some of there's some uncertainty in these. Mm -hmm. So Lee, I, we have a new SPRO in California and he's been now for a year. And um, I, I have some good contact with Mark. I can check with him because he hasn't gotten back with me anyhow about the firewood that Mike bought here last year. That was the, re, what, what did you call that? Um, reclaimed, re, reclaimed. Yeah, re, reclaimed firewood, which is just crazy. Um, so that is a big risk and we haven't figured out because 
that's one of the other issues I've ran into Oregon when we did a firewood quarantine in 2012. Um, we weren't very specific on the labeling side and blame my predecessor back then here, Dan Hilburn. Um, we do not specify really where the firewood has to come from. And we ran into that issue several times with some providers one of my inspectors found the firewood in a, in, a, in, a, in a filling station and it said, oh, the firewood is coming from whatever state. So I called them up and said, so where is your firewood actually coming from? They had no idea because they buy firewood from here, then there, they mix it all together. They have no idea. And that's the tricky part. What is the origin of the firewood? doesn't mean the firewood comes from California. The, fire, the wood is actually from California. It could be from Maine that they then import to California, mix it up there and ship it. And so that's a tricky thing. And in our labeling requirement, we put in origin of firewood because it is really important to, um, to, to, to estimate the risk associated where the firewood actually comes from. Yeah, um, and the the different risks definitely are reflected in, in a lot of different variables like climate um, for you especially, uh, but also um, existing pests. You know, the, the situation for pest presence in California, unfortunately, is um, very difficult, but that's not the case for every single state that you might produce firewood in. You have um, a talk coming up at the NAISMA, um, right, uh, next week. Do you want to talk about that just in case people want to join? Yes, well? absolutely. Thank you for reminding me. That was great. Uh, so um, the report that this particular slide um, is from, as well as several other slides you saw today from me, uh, is not yet completely finished. Um, we have an expected publication date of this coming Monday, which is extremely exciting. Um, and I will be giving two presentations next week on uh, the report itself. Uh, one will be with Emerald Ashborough University. That will be on Monday. Excuse me. That will be on Tuesday. And then the other one will be through the National Invasive Species Awareness Week through NASMA, which is the North American Invasive Species Management Association group. Um, and uh, Layla was kind enough to put the National Invasive Species Awareness Week webinar information on um, the chat. So you can just click right through and take a look at it. And we'll be doing a full report out on our report. Um, those two presentations, the Tuesday one and the Friday one will actually be the same. And so you should all just go to the Friday one because you'll be awake. The Tuesday one is quite early in the morning for Hawaii. But the Friday one's a, a little later in the day, I think. Great, thank you so much for, um, for uh coming here and for pre presenting. Thank you so much for answering questions. And yeah, like um, we wanna thank everybody for joining. Um, if the, we still have a few more talks this week uh, in the in, in Invasive Species Awareness Month. So I just put the schedule there that you can go back and see what other talks were presented and what is coming up. And you can go to the YouTube uh, page to uh, view some of the presentations that um, we had had this month and thank you so much for participating and yeah thank you very much for the wonderful talk thank you thank you yeah thank you